Hello, everyone, and welcome to Adobe Live. My name is James Bonanno, and thank you for joining us on this beautiful Wednesday morning, afternoon, wherever you are. I am joined today by a very, very special guest. He is the content producer, uh, video production master, Paco Siller, as well as an amazing landscape photographer and video producer. And he is here to join us for a very, very special, uh, let's call it Earth Week, Earth Day uh, special. So Paco, welcome to the stream today. I feel honored to get to host you today. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Um, and thank you for everybody joining. I already see the chat there. I see uh, Tim, Gus, Sam, Clever, Sean. We got everybody in the house. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for having me. This is going to be a special day for Earth Day, but we'll get more to that in a sec. I'll let James finish his uh, his talking points as the host. I'm usually the host. Absolutely. Really, yeah, so roles are reversed here. I'll kick it back to Hey, James. Roll, roles are reversed, but it's going to be a really, really fun stream. Uh, thank you, Paco. And yes, thank you to everyone joining the stream today. Welcome, everyone. Like I said, it is going to be a action-packed two-hour stream today. So let's just kick it off with a little bit of housekeeping, and then I want to dive right into Earth Day and a little bit of what's going on uh, over the next two hours. So Make sure if you're new here that you're joining us for the creative encores of the Photoshop Creative Challenges every morning at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, this week, we're replaying our top view challenges, learn a new skill in Photoshop every day. How can you beat that, right? Um, and like I said, Earth Day is Friday, so we are really here to celebrate uh, all that makes this beautiful planet, just our home and the most special special place ever. So Earth Day 2022 theme is invest in our planet. I personally have many thoughts on what that means to me. Uh, I travel professionally as a landscape photographer and video creative as well. So we will get into what Earth Day means to me as we continue through this stream. Uh, and I just wanted to, you know, first just really kick it off to our guest, uh, Paco, and, and kind of hear from you, Paco, with uh, what Earth Day means to you, uh, how you're celebrating this week and kind of every day and what you'll be uh, getting into uh, later on in the stream. Before we do kick it off, though, I want to let everyone know, please, please, please stay tuned for the end because today is a very unique stream and Paco has some uh, really special giveaways uh, for those that are sticking around. So Paco, take it away. Enough of my jabbering. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so it's Earth Day. We love the Earth. Um, I Yeah, I've been shooting landscape photography for a while. And one of the main things that drives me out to do landscape photography is just the beautiful scenery that uh, this whole world has to offer. So it means a lot to me. Everybody that knows me knows that I love the outdoors. Um, I had a tenure working in a national park. Uh, I do a lot of backpacking on my time off. So I love to see this planet in its pristine condition. And I just really hope that future generations are able to see the earth the same way that we see it now. And it's all its beautiful splendor. So it's a big reason why I do landscape photography. I just love capturing the moments out in the wilderness. It's really those parts of the world that are untouched. Uh, by humans, um, which again isn't a bad thing, but you know, going out to the wilderness and really having that whole place to yourself, it's really something special. So I love to do that in my spare time, and it means a lot to me. So yeah, I'm usually I'm usually not a guest on Adobe Love. I'm usually a host, but I decided to make an exception today because it is Earth Day, and yeah, I wanted to give you all a glimpse on how I shoot my landscape photography. Uh, which speaking of that, I do have uh, another special treat for you all. We actually made a video on how I shoot. My landscape photos so a lot of times on the live stream you're actually editing the photos on lightroom or photoshop or what have you but i guess the question is is how do you actually get those great photos so i do have a, a video i'm going to play here shortly that actually takes me out to the field and i kind of explain my process when i'm actually out shooting landscape photography for sunsets sunrises all that jazz awesome awesome well we're very very excited to see that paco and i think uh, I myself appreciate the the behind the scenes, the work that goes into actually getting the beautiful landscape uh, photos that you do have on your Instagram, uh, all over all over the interwebs. You, your work is absolutely stunning, and and the time lapses you create. So, other than just doing what you're doing for Adobe, uh, you really have a special eye for capturing Earth in its in its purest form. And I think that's uh, certainly why you're here today to really show us this process. Um, I myself feel that there is. Uh, just magic everywhere you look when you really immerse yourself in nature and you do such a great job bringing us into that world. So, I mean, yeah, yeah unbelievable. So um, I'm, I'm very excited to see this video. Uh, and again, for those that are joining us uh, and are new to Adobe Live, please make sure 
uh, that you're in the chat and send your questions, any comments you have, how you're celebrating Earth Day today. We want to make this as interactive as possible over the next two hours uh, and tomorrow as well. And uh, any questions you have for Paco, please leave them in the chat and I will continue to feed those uh, feed those for you. So Paco, uh, what are you going to show us first? I know you have a huge surprise with this video. Are we going to kick that off and then get into some of the editing? Yeah, 100%. Um, I do want to shout out my Instagram real quick uh, just to kind of show some of my work. So there it is. It's at Paco Siller. Uh, but here's some of the type of photography that I do, right? So this was pretty recently in Tahoe. This photo came out great. I love it. Oh, so nice. Um, this is actually Minaret Lakes in the Eastern Sea Eras. Very pretty. Uh, these are some of the time lapses that I do, right? It's This is actually called a hyperlapse. So it's a blend of like a moving time lapse. Super crazy to shoot. Very, um, a lot of trial and error <laughs> to get those. Uh, but yeah, this is this is kind of the stuff that I love to do, right? So this this is like my zen right here, just uh, catching the earth in all the splendor. And this is my partner Jamie here. She she likes to dirt bag it with me as much as I do. <laughs> so. I love it. Well, it's safe to say that you are a mountain guy, and I know we've we've spoken about this a lot on the streams. But uh, are the mountains and the lakes sort of your your happy place? Would you say? That's it. Yeah, mountains and lakes, alpine, emerald lakes backpacking, all that stuff. So yeah, that's definitely where you'll find me on my spare time. Um, yeah, and as James said, uh, this is a safe space. I always love to shout that out in Adobe Live. Um, you know, anybody can go and watch a how-to video on how to do photos, but these are different because we have a two-way interaction with all of you that are in the audience. So if y'all have any questions or any comments or you wanna stop me to find out how I did something or me to explain something, please shout it out in the chat. Uh, again, we're at be.net slash Adobe Live. Uh, James is keeping an eye on the chat. So yeah, James, feel free to interrupt me if you see any questions. And uh, yeah. Perfect. That's how we'll All do right, this awesome. Yeah. We, we, cool. got a, right. we got a very jazzed up chat uh, today and I am equally as excited. So let's just, uh, let's just get into it, Paco. Cool. All right. Well, I'm going to play the uh, intro video. So this is the video of how I actually shoot um, the photos that we're going to be editing today. So. Again, it's pretty special. The shots that we actually took during the stream is what we're going to be editing once it ends. So I hope you enjoy the video. Uh, it's pretty goofy. It's silly. It's got my sense of humor, but I think there's a lot of informative stuff. So here we go. I'm going to go ahead and queue up the video now. So we'll see you all in a little bit. Hey friends, Paco here. I have something special for you all today. We're going to pack our camera bags and actually hit the road to shoot some landscape photography outdoors. It's going to be with none other than this guy. Oh hey, didn't see you there. I'm Paco, but in another room Paco. Anyways, let's talk gear. We should have a general idea of what we're going to shoot and where we're going. This will give us a better idea of what gear to bring. For this specific shoot, we're going to be shooting some wide-angled landscape photography which means I'll be bringing this lens. It's a 16 to 35 millimeter lens that will give me a variety of different framing options. Ah yes, the sound of flexibility. Thanks creepy Paco back in the office. Now, I usually like to do a little bit of hiking to get away from the crowds and get a unique shot. So I'm gonna opt for lightweight and portable gear. I'll be bringing this carbon fiber tripod, which clocks in only at about one and a half pounds. That's about 0.7 kilograms from my metric friends. This Canon 5D Mark III. I have two SD cards inside and shooting in the raw format. Very important. An ND filter in case we want to go for that silky smooth water effect or blur some clouds. Some extra batteries. Always need to have one or two of these handy. Trust me. Hey, honestly, man, just let me get through this. Like I said, I try not to overdo it with my gear. The lighter it is, the more comfortable that hike will be. Speaking of comfortability, I'm gonna place this gear inside this day pack. It's got a chest strap, so it's gonna be really great in taking the weight off those shoulders. With all this photo planning, I've yet to reveal where we'll be shooting. We're headed to Lake Tahoe. The plan is to shoot a sunset on the Nevada side of the lake. The reason we're shooting on the east side of the lake is because the sun will set to the west. This is where I assume most of the color will be. This app shows me where the sunsets are, which is helpful in planning my shoots. 
All right, so here we are at our location. This is the hiking part. I like to get here early. I like to make sure I got everything I need. And then it's just easy coasting until the sun sets. So we do all the hard work before the sun sets. We don't want to miss it. All right, so we're kind of getting to where I'm thinking we need to be shooting. So I'm gonna go explore down over there. All right, so here we are in the location I pretty much had in mind. It's looking pretty darn good. We have some beautiful rocks that we can use as the foreground. Got some good cloud coverage. Cloud coverage is good. That's actually what gives us the beautiful sunsets that we all see in amazing photography. Right off the bat, looking for some leading elements. Uh, what I mean by leading elements are kind of framing up your picture so that the eye naturally wanders down the framing into some awesome focal points. A great example of leading elements comes from our friend Toby Shinobi's work. Notice how he composes his shots so that your eyes naturally wander towards specific focal points. This is a great case study on how using natural and artificial elements can enhance photography. All right, so I think I know where we're gonna be shooting. We're actually gonna be shooting, boom, right down there in that little cove. We're gonna head down there and I'm gonna let you know how the framing is and how we're gonna compose this shot. Check this out, it's a ducky. Give a thumbs up emoji to our duck friend who's enjoying this view as much as we are. All right, so here's our framing. Let me explain why I chose this. So first of all, I have a really nice reflection with the still water right here. So when you have still water like this, it makes for amazing reflections. So I definitely want that in my shot. And then also, look at these clouds. They're just, they're not going anywhere. They're kind of staying put. So I definitely want these clouds in the background. All right, so one thing I haven't talked about is the type of photography I do, especially for sunsets. And that is called HDR photography or high dynamic range photography. Now, the reason that we wanna do HDR photography is because my camera can't really capture all the dynamic range that is gonna be in a setting like this, right? I gotta either expose for the sun or I gotta expose for the foreground or the middle ground. I can't have it all at least with this camera. So what I do is I set it up so when I do one shutter fire, it's gonna take three shots in immediate order. We can actually blend these three exposures together so that we get one photo that has all the dynamic range, the foreground, the background, and the middle ground. So let me show you how I set that up on my camera now. This is pretty much what we're looking for. For this Canon camera, it's called Expo Comp or AEB. Okay, so that's kind of what I'm looking for in this camera. So when I go there, you gotta set the setting, right? What are your three exposures gonna be? So for me, I'm gonna set it. I'm gonna move the shutter wheel, right? And then these three bars represent the three different shots that this camera's gonna take. So we have one shot that's gonna be in zero, one shot that's gonna be two stops overexposed, and one shot that is two stops underexposed. So I'm gonna hit okay, let me show you how that looks. All right, so I'm gonna take, I'm gonna pull the trigger once, boom. Then listen to this. Did you hear that go? One, two, three, and then it took three shots. One, I'll show you. There's one, two, and three. One more thing I wanted to talk about was how to frame your shot, okay? There's all different types of overlays to do, but probably the easiest one and that most people know is the rule of thirds. And I'm kind of framing it so where the lines intersect, I have these places of interest, right? So on the left side, I kind of have this awesome color that we're starting to get with the sunset. And on the right side, on those intersecting points are where I think that color is really gonna be on those clouds. All right, without further ado, we're probably 15, 20 minutes away here. So I'm gonna start shooting. Let's do it. I'm gonna say right now, even if we don't get this color that I'm hoping we get with these clouds here, I'm pretty satisfied with these shots. We'll have some good stuff to edit in the studio. Hey, check it out, more ducks. All right, friends, I'm gonna go ahead and officially call it. Uh, it's about 10, 15 minutes past when the weather app says it's gonna sunset, so I really don't think we're gonna get much color on these clouds, but hey, that's all right. I had an amazing time 
being out here with you all, showing you my process and how to shoot landscape photography. And yeah, I hope you all learned something here. We're actually gonna take these photos that we took. There's still some very good ones, I think, that we took in this little session. But we're gonna take it back to the studio, to Studio Paco, and we're gonna edit these photos live with you all. All right, so again, thanks for tuning in and uh, let's kick it back to the studio. All right, Man. there you have it. The first wow. ever uh, Adobe, uh, we're, we're calling these actually Adobe Live Originals. Might do more of them, but yeah, I hope that was uh, informative. I hope it gave you a little bit of uh, some pre-context and how we're gonna be shooting, or sorry, editing the photos today and kind of where my mind goes when I'm getting these shots, right? I mean, anybody can edit a photo, but you know, I definitely wanted to explain how you get a great photo and some of the things I'm thinking about, some of the inspiration I get, like the leading elements that we'll talk more about, the rule of thirds and all that jazz. Awesome. Well, I, yeah, I love that format. I think, uh, I hope that you continue to do those originals because, um, just the chat was sort of blowing up just the time lapses, the production, the humor, the, the educational value that you, you put into that. And, and, uh, as a landscape photographer myself, uh, and just a photographer in general, I think we often forget how important it is to really slow down and focus on those those elements and really take your time. And uh, I'm really, really excited to see the finished results and see your process now after looking uh, looking at the shots that you got on that beautiful lake. Awesome. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah, I was watching the chat too. It seemed like everybody enjoyed it. Uh, I'm glad you all enjoyed it. That was really fun to make. Uh, again, that's half the reason why I shoot landscape photography. It's just being outdoors. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll explain more of what happened. Um, I was really planning on there being color in the clouds, and I'll show you the shots here in just a second. Uh, but the color never came, right? But that's that's what happens when you do landscape photography. You're not always going to get amazing, like super bright fire clouds. Uh, you just got to keep doing it. You got to stick with the consistency. And I promise you, if you keep waking up early or you keep shooting sunsets, you are going to get an amazing sunset. But with that, with that being said, though, I still think we got some good shots. So we're going to look at those uh, right about now. So Awesome. Awesome. All right, cool. Yeah, so it's... here we are. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, let's, let's dive right in. Let's, uh, any, and okay. a, again, everyone in the chat is, is loving it so far. So as we get into the, uh, the process here, please ask as many questions as you can and, and use Paco as the amazing resource he is right now. So yes, please ask questions. I'm looking at the chat too. So if y'all have any questions, shout them out. We'll be looking at them. Um, okay. So what I wanted to do right here is I wanted to imitate the process of what happens when I've taken these shots they're fresh out of my um, SD card and I'm gonna import them to Lightroom. Okay, so when you start shooting a lot of photography, you definitely wanna be organized, right? The organization is gonna help pay off miles down the road when you start to have thousands of photographs in a catalog. So I'm gonna show you how I import them, how my folder hierarchy is, and I'm gonna show you how I blend them in, uh, uh, how I blend them for HDR photography. Okay, and then once I do that, we'll actually hop on to another Lightroom catalog where I already have everything else. I was telling James, I kind of Martha Stewart it, right? I don't think I want you guys to like watch me do all of this and then, uh, you know, just sit through all the tedious stuff, but we'll jump in ahead in time. So let me, let me go ahead and show you right now what happened. So this is my catalog. Let's say I want to import the photos. I'm going to go to import, okay? And then I have an SD drive uh, hooked up to this where I have the photo. So I can show you this. Uh, folder hierarchy that I have is depending on what you know I, I have multiple cameras so this one I shot it with a 5d mark 3 so I have a folder for the 5d mark 3 and then I have years right so in these year folders is where I put all the other months right so if we go to 2016 you can see all the shots that I've had in 2016 and they're filtered by month and when that um, sh shoot took place so we're in 2022 obviously can't believe it's 2022 already time is just flying by What's happening yeah. in time, James? I just don't understand it. Uh, so here are all the shots that we took for that shoot, okay? So as you see, we have a lot, because again, I did HDR photography. So every time I took one shot, it took three with three different exposures, okay? So I wanna go ahead and import those to my catalog, okay? So they're coming from this T7 SD drive that I have into the catalog that lives in the um, drive of this computer. And I like to give these keywords, okay? So. Again, when you're filtering through your photos, and you're like, oh, I remember I shot this awesome landscape shot in 2017. Then in Lightroom, I can 
put the keywords 2017 mountains lake and it'll filter for those shots and it's a lot easier to find when you just have a big catalog like i like to have so i'm gonna say 2022 lake tahoe sunset duckies because we had some <laughs> ducky homies there okay so then i'm gonna go ahead and import these okay so lightroom's gonna do its thing it's gonna import these from this sd drive into a lightroom catalog okay and then here they are pretty quickly okay now as you can see, they're living in a folder called Previous Import. And I actually want to go to the, the folder that they live on. So I can right click on any of these photos and then go to Folder in Library. Okay. And then right now, um, in the, um, I'm in the module where I can see all my photos. But I do want to go to the Develop module. So I'm going to hit D. And this will take me to the Develop module. And then here are the photos, right? So as you can see, this is one shot in an HDR photo. So I exposed for the sun here, which means I didn't blow out the clouds because I wanted to get the clouds here, all that information. Right here, I exposed for more or less the midtones, right? I kind of made it super dark, so we have that information. And then here I exposed for the foreground, okay? So we have all the foreground. There's all that sweet, sweet data, but I did blow out the clouds. This is what I was talking about, right? With the Canon 5D Mark III, you can't really get all the dynamic range in a shot like this, because there's just a lot. I mean, you're literally looking at a sun and then it's pretty much given a silhouette. You know, some cameras, some super fancy high-end cameras might be able to get all that high dynamic range, but we're not working with that. I don't have like 10 grand to drop in some medium format camera. Um, so this is a great workaround to do. And you, as you can see here, are the three shots are so one, two, three. Now, the way you blend them into one photo that has all the dynamic range, all the data of these three exposures couldn't be any easier with Lightroom. So let me show you how you do that. You hold shift and I'm gonna highlight these three photos. So I'm gonna go left, cause I'm, you know, right here is where I'm currently selected. So that's my, that's the photo I'm on and I'm gonna hold shift and then go one, two, three. So now I have all of these camera, or sorry, all of these photos highlighted. Then I'm gonna right click and then we will go to photo merge and HDR and then watch this magic. Okay. So boom, there is Ooh. an HDR photo, okay? So wow. always have auto align because there might be some just slight, slight nuances and uh, movement between the three shots, especially if there's a moving mirror, it might shake the camera a little bit. So have that, we'll take care of that. And then I like to have auto settings on because if I don't have that on, it's pretty much gonna look like, like what happened, right? So it's just one more thing I have to do when I blend and I'll show you that in a sec. So let's have auto settings off and then I'll show you what I would have to do if I didn't have this on. And then um, there's deghosting amount. So deghosting amount is actually pretty cool because say you had some movement or a duck flew in and I didn't want the duck. Um, depending on whether you hit low, medium, or high, it's actually going to take that uh, movement in the photo out and replace it with another part of the photo because you have three exposures you're working with. So if, if one of them um, had some element that you didn't like, then you can try low, medium, or high, and it might take those out. You know, And I'll show you which part is it's actually taken out. So hmm. you look over here, I saw some movement there. So it highlights it in red, what it's actually doing. So I do do this sometimes when I don't like right here, it just sees a lot of movement. So it's replacing it with other parts, but it's kind of irrelevant hmm. in this sense, just because it's all pretty static. I didn't have a person or something moving a lot. So I'm just going to hit none. Okay. And then create stack. This is going to make your uh, photo filtering process a lot easier. And I'll show you what that does. So I'm going to go ahead and hit merge. Okay, so it's merging. So Paco, then, as this is as this is merging, I just have a question for you. Um, yeah, shoot. In terms of the video itself that you you showed earlier, you uh, went over how to actually get these stacks, right? Like, so you're you're shooting two stops underexposed, two stops overexposed, and then that shot right in the middle. So is your idea when you're setting up for these landscape shots to expose that first shot? Uh, sort of that's like your middle ground. And then when you decide whether it's going to be two or three stops over and under, then it would give you all the detail that you need for this HDR. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, I actually had that explained in the video, but if I didn't cut this video down, we'd be sitting here for 45 minutes. I talked so much, but that's a great point. And I actually did bring that up. So my initial shot, uh, you know, when you saw that, that, uh, the light meter on the camera, there's like zero plus one plus two. I'm exposing the middle shot at zero because that's what the camera thinks is the safe 
uh, image, right? It's not clipping anything. It's not blowing anything out. So I make that zero and that's actually, I think it's the exposure that's just middle exposed. So it's not this one. It's not this one. I think it's this one. This one's middle. So right here, it's not really clipping anything. It's not really blowing anything out, but that's the middle shot. And then the other two are two stops underexposed and two stops overexposed. Okay. Gotcha. gotcha. Uh, and then here's okay. the stack, right? So I can just do this and then there's a stack and then you know, I can do this for the rest of the shots, which, you know, we're going to skip this process because it'll take forever. But I just want to show you how I do one, just so you know how to blend an HDR shot. OK, but what it did cool. is it created one more image called the DNG. OK, now this image actually has all the raw data of those three exposures. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So if I increase the shadows, check it out. I have some nice clean shadows here that are not noisy. OK, so if this was just one exposure and I increase the shadows and you might start to see uh, some noise because it's already pushing the raw data from that pretty intensely, right? So I can show you what I mean by that here. So if I bring up the shadows, you know, right here, it's not really bringing it up much. You know, I can, ex I can bring the exposure more, but here's that noise I'm talking about, right? You're kind of getting the best of all exposure worlds by doing HDR. Okay. So it's just, you know, in the shadows here, it starts to get noisy because there's not a lot of data there. But with this one HDR shot, we got all the data in the uh, shadows and the highlights and in the midtones. So what I usually do is just off the bat and what the auto settings pretty much does when I click it is it brings the shadows up or bring the highlights down. And again, look at all that sweet, sweet information I have up here, right? I'm not, I'm not uh, toning this down too much. You know, I start to get some good color here because it's not blown out. And then, yeah, I just have all that, all that data in one single exposure that we can edit uh, as one exposure and just make it look very cool, okay? So what I would do here is for the rest of these shots is I would go through the same process, right? I would go ahead and um, just blend all these in HDR. So this takes a while, but you know, that's, that's what you gotta do with HDR. So. A quick way I do it is I hold shift and I go one, two, three. I know I always do um, three different exposures and control H is actually the shortcut for HDR. So again, do right. shortcuts, my friends. Uh, the more you start to do something in these Adobe apps, the more that time can uh, start to add up. Yeah, I think it's doing it because I actually picked the three wrong shots. So one, two, three. Okay, now, these are Paco, I have another uh, question for you. And yeah, um, please do. everyone everyone in the chat, first of all, thinks that you need to start a YouTube channel. I concur with that as well. If you do not have one, uh, you're extremely good at explaining this, even to someone like me who is familiar with this. But I don't, I really, uh, I feel bad saying it. I don't use HDR in a lot of my work. And this is, this is a eye-opening experience. Um, my question was, do you, when you're out in the field, do you use any sort of graduated like neutral density filters or any, um, you know, stops so that you're actually stopping these highlights down, uh, on one shot, or is it just easier and a little bit more convenient to shoot this way? Uh, yeah, great question. So I actually did include that in my gear bag when I was doing that video. And sometimes I do, it depends, right? I like to have it just to have that option when I'm on the field. Um, and then I usually make a game time decision when I've actually posted up and realized what I'm, what I'm going to shoot. Okay. So the, for this specific example, the water was pretty still where we were. So I wanted that still water. I wanted that reflection. Um, I didn't really want to use the ND filter. Now, if I had a lot of movement in the water, then if I just took one fast shutter, then you're just going to see like fast movement. So something that's cool to do with that, to just kind of work with what you have, that's kind of what the, uh, one of the mantras is with landscape photography is, Hey, work with what you got. Cause you can't control the elements of the weather is I would usually put an ND filter when I have a lot of, mo uh, a lot of movement in the water, because then you're going to get that kind of like silky smooth water effect, which can look very cool. Right. I actually use those a lot when I'm shooting a seascape photography. So when I'm shooting uh, oceans that just move all the time, it's cool to put an ND filter there and just kind of have uh, that movement of the water that can make some for some very cool shots. And the same thing with waterfalls. Waterfalls, I almost always use an ND filter because you just like to see that like silky smooth waterfall effect. Right, right. Yeah, that's that's so true. And I and I think like it's probably easy to go a little overboard. Uh, I remember just starting out and having like a 10 stop uh, and all these graduated filters and just all you wanted to or all I wanted to do was shoot water to just make it whimsical and smooth. And um, is that something that you can take it a little overboard and realize like, okay, you don't always have to shoot water in a silky way. You can shoot it and capture it the way it looks. 
Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, that's the beautiful thing about doing this, right? Or you could argue with any of the arts and creative disciplines is there's no really right or wrong answers. I mean, there's guidelines that can definitely help improve your photography or your art. Uh, but once you know those, you can bend them and break them. So, I mean, if you'd like to shoot ND filters, hey, have at it. I mean, there's a lot of people I know that just shoot only with ND filters and that's their style, you know? So it's, it's really up to you. And like I said, I just make a game time decision when I get there, but I do like to have that option just in case, you know, especially if you have some fast moving clouds. Oh man. Yeah. You know, when you put yeah, an ND yeah. filter with some fast moving clouds, those can make for some very cool shots, especially when you have some color on those clouds. So yeah. Um, okay, cool. Let's get back to this. Um, all right, I'm going to jump into another catalog where I've actually already blended all of these photos as HDRs and then kind of selected which ones I think we should edit. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. So let's see, we'll open a new catalog. I believe it's this one. I'll go ahead and relaunch it. Where's the chat? I see you all chat. What's up? <laughs> Um, so question from Laura in the chat, uh, are you mm -hmm. using only a Canon camera or are you also shooting with, uh, your phone at any time? Uh, usually if I'm going to go out and shoot something, I'm going to bring my Canon camera. Uh, I bought that Canon 5D Mark three years ago. It's kind of a tank these days. Like it's still a still mirrorless is. camera. Still is so great. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's definitely a lot heavier than most of the mirrorless cameras, which has been the trend in the last couple of years. They actually got rid of the mirror. And so they can make them smaller and a lot more lightweight, but that Canon 5D Mark III, I mean, it's a tank. Like I've put it through snow, through rain. It's like fell in the ocean <laughs> and it still works because it's weatherproof. Um, so I'm kind of in the camp. If it ain't, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, it, it does add yep. some extra pounds when I'm, when I'm out backpacking. Uh, but you know, it's kind of the sacrifice I do to like be able to take a really, really cool camera and shoot some awesome photography. Uh, if I don't feel like doing a shoot, I will take my iPhone. So these cameras just get better and better, right? I've actually gotten some really cool cam uh, photo cameras on this. And I would argue if you're just getting into this, like please do not feel the need to just spend like hundreds or thousands of dollars in camera gear, you know, use what you have, which most people have a smartphone these days. So start doing photography with this, right? And see if you even like it, right? Maybe you find out that you yep. don't like photography and you just save yourself hundreds and thousands of dollars because the stuff ain't cheap. <laughs> Uh, oh my so God, definitely work with, work with what you have, shoot with a camera. Uh, you'll get to, you'll start to find out, uh, what type of photography you'd like to use. Right. So, uh, you know, you start to make more educated decisions. The more you get into photography, like, do you want to buy a wide angle lens? Do you want to buy a telephoto lens? So yeah, work with what you got. Uh, Absolutely. okay. So let's jump back into this. So here are all the shots that I took during this shoot. Okay. So. And, and these, these are, are all... and these shots are all HDR. This is your HDR yeah, raw shot right. now that you're now tweaking a little bit further. Yeah, these are all HDR and they have the auto settings applied. Okay, so gotcha. I like to just click that auto setting because um, it makes me easier just to kind of look at my, what my selects are and what I want to edit. Okay, because I'll show you if they if it wasn't on auto, then I'm pretty much staring at something like this. Because this doesn't really tell me much about the photo, right? Like the shadows are still pretty obscure. The highlights are blown out. So since this is an HDR, you can hit auto settings. You know, I think it's command U. Yeah, there we go. Uh, and this already shows me like I'm, I'm not, I'm now more looking at the framing, you know, like these rocks, uh, obviously it's very not, uh, on the horizon. So this is something that I would keep in mind for the specific shot. So yeah, I just, I'd like to make it easier when I'm looking through these photos to decide, uh, which shot I actually want to edit. Okay. So I'll just show you the whole shoot. You know, and again, uh, mm. during this shoot, it looked like we were going to get some crazy color right here. You know, I, I even had another buddy on the other side of the lake. I was like, dude, this is going to be an epic shoot. He was shooting it too. And the color <laughs> just never came. It was such a tease. But well, it's again, just like that's... one one cloud can, I, I dare I say ruin it because in no way did you ruin these photos. They look, they look beautiful. But uh, you know that situation when you're waiting, you're waiting for just to, to sneak behind the cloud and create more of that pink purple color. Um, yeah. cause it's interesting that you have such, it's so blue because that, that sun ended up hugging behind that cloud, but it also creates a really, a really stunning look as well. Yeah. And you know, I think what happened is these were very low hanging clouds. And since the sun has to go behind some mountains, I think by the time it was starting to shine this light up again, against the clouds, um, it was already too low. I think if these clouds were higher then they would have been painted at the bottom, kind of like what was happening here. Uh, but again, that's the, that's the beauty of landscape photography. You just, you never know if you're going to get yep. amazing, but again, you know, we, 
one thing I learned as I was shooting is even if you don't get this amazing car that everybody chases, you still have so many options to shoot, right? Like work with what you have. And I had to learn that the hard way. I mean, I remember when my partner and I were just doing photography in New Zealand. It's like, God, I'm not getting good sunsets. And then I was like, you know what? This is still a beautiful place. Just like come up with some yeah. creative framing. Like there's always something to shoot. Well, and then right. getting into posts like this, and and I, I often find that, you know, the post-production process sometimes is when I, I find that, oh, there's a shot that I didn't think uh, was actually as beautiful as it was. And I, I look at it and I realize, okay, like depending on how it's framed, uh, something stands out that I didn't see or I didn't anticipate getting. Um, right. Paco, I do, I do have a couple questions from the chat here. There's some great questions coming in. Yeah. Um, I know sure. you're continuing your work here, but Tom has a question about white balance, um, which I think is is a very valid question. How do you yeah, account for white balance. white balance? So that is a good reason and uh, a very good, yeah, a good reason why shoot in raw. So what's cool about shooting in raw is you can actually really manipulate the white balance and it won't ruin the photo. Uh, so I almost always don't ever set my white balance when I'm shooting. Um, I just set it to auto because the auto does a pretty good job in already getting what it should be. And if it doesn't nail it, then I can just change it through uh, obviously these sliders, right? So here it is getting super warm, here it is getting cool. Uh, but auto does a pretty pretty good job where I usually don't mess with it unless I obviously see that it's super off. And again, that's one of the benefits of shooting raw. You just have the option to just really manipulate it and the camera won't, or sorry, the photo won't be ruined. Um, okay, nice. so let's actually get into some editing. So I know that's what people are here for. So, um, oh, real quick, in the, in the shoot, uh, in the video shoot, I shouted out that I always like to shoot a lot of photos before I think the sunset or the real color is going to pop and some shots afterwards. Because for this instance, I thought this was just the beginning of what was going to be an awesome paint and it never came, but I had a safety net, right? So these are actually the photos that I ended up wanting to use um, were the shots I took before I thought even the like color was going to pop off. And the reason is, is because this is happening right here, right? This is already starting to look pretty cool. So we're going to, we're going to make this my shot. Okay. So I highlighted this green because this means that this is a shot that I want to edit. And then we could try one or two other shots in the shoot to see uh, which one we like better. But you know, like these already here, this is where I'm mainly looking. This is already looking really cool. Um, yeah, so let's, let's go ahead and edit this one. I'm going to go ahead and just reset it. So we just start with a blank photo and just show you my process, okay? So what I like to do is I, look, I like to look at this histogram right here, okay? So this is giving me a lot of information of what's going on with this photo, right? When you have this highlighted and it's white, it's letting me know that there's parts of this photo that are um, that there's no data there, right? So for the left side, it's the blacks. For the right side, it's the whites, right? So as you can see, as I highlight over this, tell me right now that in this blue section, there is no data in the blacks because it's so dark. And the same thing over here, that right here, this parts that are highlighted in white are blown out. So again, cue in the magic of raw photography, right? I can actually increase the blacks to get that data back and boom, it's gray now. So now I brought information in that area again. Okay, so it's not completely blown out. And then I can actually bring the whites down to kind of bring that back a little bit. Oh, actually, I don't know if this is gonna do it. it I got rid of the white, but not saying I'm clipping a red channel, but that's okay, because you know this is the sun and it's always gonna be clipped like that. Okay, so that's one thing I look at. Another cool thing to do is you can hold option, right? And if you start sliding this right now, Everything that shows up in color like this says that there's no data. So what I usually do is I like to slide these until all that goes away. Boom, cool. I know I have all the blacks and the same thing with the whites, right? So if I slide this all the way, like I'm clipping all that information out. So I'll just slide it until that goes away for the most part. And, you know, again, that's the sun. So I'm okay if that's clipped a little bit, okay? And then we'll do the usual um, HDR workflow, which is I'll increase the shadows to bring that sweet, sweet information back. And then I'll turn down the highlights, okay? Now look at that, okay? We already have some cool information here. And I always like to hit this um, one keystroke below the delete button on a Mac keyboard. Um, I think it's the backslash. Don't, yep, yeah, you know, it's the, the before I, and after key. Yeah, the before and after, right? So there we go. There's before and there's after just with those adjustments, wow. okay? Um, all right, Looks so now great. what I usually like to do here is I'll give it a little bit of vibrance just to give it some color. Uh, I don't like to add a lot of saturation because saturation just gives like blanket color across the entire image. Vibrance has this cool feature where it just kind of target the areas that it think it needs colors and it does a really good job in protecting skin tones as well. So if you're ever um, doing portrait photography or uh, shots of people, just mess with Vibrance because it's not going to make the skin tone super saturated to the point that it's going to look super unnatural. Okay? Yeah. 
So I have some vibrance and just looking at this photo, I can tell that it needs contrast, right? So that's one of the reasons why I love to go to this tone curve. Okay, there's different, um, there's different parts of this tone curve. Like you can do it this way where it will just kind of target certain areas, but I like, yeah, let me reset that. I like to do it this tone curve where I can really manipulate this whole line. So I'll usually do your standard S curve, which is pretty common when you're color grading or just editing photos. You're just gonna give this some contrast, right? So I'm gonna bring it down here in the shadows. And in case you might not know how the tone curve reads, it, it reads from like bottom left to bottom right. So you kind of have all your shadows, your dark tones here, here are your mid-tones, excuse me. And here are your highlights, okay? So if I manipulate this area of the tone curve, I'm gonna mess with the darker parts of this photo. So if I brought this down, you see that it's affecting the darker part of this photo, which is the rocks, right? And then since I brought this down, I wanna bring the lighter parts of this photo just a little bit up, okay? Boom. And these little switches show you the before and after. So I'll show you how much this just did. You know, I love hitting this. I love toggling yeah. things on and off to see my adjustments, okay? So that's before you can see it's a little more flat, right? But then this gives it that sweet, sweet contrast we all like, okay? And now a question uh, for those that are new to using the tone curve, because sometimes that tone curve can get a little intimidating for someone that's just, you know, editing a photo for the first time. Uh, the reason that you would start on your basic adjustments, which you just did, your highlights, your shadows, or your highlights, your blacks, your whites, shadows, those things, is to give you sort of this really good over or perfectly exposed image. Uh, and in this case, rather than adding contrast on those settings, the reason for adding them on the tone curve is just you have more flexibility, right? Like the contrast 100%. on the basic adjustment is almost like a global contrast, the same yeah, way saturation yeah, is. Yeah, very good point. Yeah, I usually don't touch uh, the contrast up here because like you said, James, very good point. This this is just super global, right? And you can see it kind of, just kind of give it too much contrast, right? To me, this is too much. You know, some people like this, there's no right or wrong answers when it comes to editing. Uh, but to me, this is just a little too much. You know, you'll see in my editing style that I like to just make subtle adjustments on all these little things. And they may not seem like much when I'm doing these subtle adjustments. When you put all those things together, then they all kind of work cohesively to like make the magic in a photo. Okay. So this is kind of like a global just stamp on contrast. This really targets specific areas. So it's a little bit more fine tuned. Right. Okay. Uh, cool. Another thing I'll do is I'll just kind of go down all the little uh, modules here in Lightroom. I usually don't mess with luminance or saturation. Um, sometimes I do actually like say, you know, right here, I didn't really see that see through blue water. Like if you were to come out here in Lake Tahoe at like noon, this would be crystal clear and blue. So I might want to enhance that a little bit. And when you want to enhance light, it's called the luminance. Okay. So something I like to do is you'll click this little guy right here. Okay. And then it can target the actual colors in a photograph. So if I were to click this area, let's say this was blue, and I just kind of scroll up on the mouse pad, you can see that blue slider start to go uh, to the right because it's enhancing mm -hmm. that luminance. Again, it's not really doing much right now. Well, it, it did do a lot of it. It's kind of did like a global thing on all the blue there. And some could argue that looks pretty cool. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I'm not going to mess with that for now. Okay. Um, one other thing I always like to do in these HDR shots is get rid of uh, chromatic aberration. And let me show you what that is, okay? Do you see this green outline on this rock right here? You see that, James? Yep, yep. That That is some chromatic aberration right there, okay? And it's just kind of this natural phenomenon that happens with the lens and the way that the light hits it. Just gives it this like little like RGB color effect. And actually in post-production, a lot of people like to use chromatic aberration. It gives it like this retro like blue, red, green thing, but we don't like them in our photos. So we're gonna get rid of them and all we have to do is hit remove chromatic aberration. Check it out. Boom. Just see boom. That? Boom. Just killed it. Why just is, like that. Why is Lightroom so these I, I every year they just get better and better and I feel like that you don't even realize that is part of your image unless you know to look for it. And exactly. I find do you find the same way that with a wide angle lens like so you were shooting with that 16 to 35 f4 as you mentioned in your video. I find that with wide angle lenses I see more of that chromatic aberration and why is that why don't you see it as much with let's say a telephoto or a prime lens uh that's a good question i don't know the exact answer if i had to guess i think it's just because it's wide you know like mm -hmm. if you look at if you look at the way that the lens profile is and especially if you look at a fisheye you could see more of like a concave element on the uh, glass and the hood of the lens and i think that's just more prone to like refracting light a certain way than a telephoto lens 
So yeah, right. I mean, it, it happens a lot. Like I shoot a lot of wide angle landscape photography because I just want to get all that nature in there. Right. Um, so it's something that does happen, but you know, at the click of a button, it's pretty much gone. Okay. It looks so um, good already. I know, I know. You're I know not we're not even this, done yet. You know, it's it looks like great. It's one of those things we're great. like, but wait, there's more. <laughs> um, Okay, so one thing that I should have done off the bat is uh, just adjust for the crop, okay? And what I mean by that is I could tell this is off um, the horizon just a little bit. Again, Lightroom just makes it easy for you these days. So I'm just going to hit auto and it's going to do a pretty good job in actually making sure that that is uh, level, okay? You can always do it manually, right? You can just kind of bring this up or down. Uh, another cool thing that I like to do is if there is a tree is you can hit this angle. Like, let's say I wanted to match it with this tree. You can just bring this line matching to a tree that goes straight and then it'll line it up to that, which is very cool. Okay, but auto nothing much, drives think, Nothing drives me crazier than seeing a beautiful landscape photo and the horizon line is just slightly off to your eye. If someone I with know. the naked eye could see that, you as the editor did not do your job. Exactly, yeah. I've actually thought, you know, when you start these photos so long, you just become uh, numb to these things. You don't really see them. So it's always good to just show these to other friends and family so that um, they can give you some feedback. And I've done that before. And they're like, Paco, this is so off center. And I'm like, oh, I never would have seen that. Like, <laughs> um, I know that pain. Matt Matt in the chat, uh, Paco has a question about the dehaze tool. Um, and I know in this specific photo, you're not using it, but uh, w where would that be an appropriate uh, time to use the dehaze, the, uh, dehaze yeah, tool? Yeah, um, it depends. What I've used it before is to cut through some atmospheric haze. It actually does a good job in cutting through haze, especially if you're shooting something like way out in the landscape. Um, another cool thing to do, and this is a good segue to get into masks, which I was going to get into anyway, is it can give this cool effect on the sky, right? So let's say I did a linear gradient. Uh, and again, where, where it's red, it's, it's where your adjustments are going to take effects, right? So you can just toggle this on and off by hitting O. Um, so what I used to do a lot is actually add some dehaze to the sky because it's going to give it this super moody look, all right? Um, and I'll show you that. So and let's get rid of that to see our adjustments. You know, you see what it's doing there? It's mm -hmm. like making it yep. super moody. But to me, you know, as I started editing more, I'm like, this is a little too saturated. You know, I think it's a little too much. Again, I like to be subtle with my edits because I do like to recreate what I, I remember seeing in the naked eye. And I don't like to really just go overboard. So, you know, some people might like this. I mean, this already made the sky look better, but it's not really my jam. It's doing something weird with the um, clouds yeah. here, right? I think it's just too much. So, yeah, that's that's one way to use dehaze. And you can also use it as a brush. I'll show you that in a sec. But anyways, let's get into masks because that's a very cool part of photo editing. And I would argue what can really make photos pop. Now, if you all are familiar with Lightroom, they've totally redone the masking feature. And I'm yes. going to say is for the way better. Okay. So I'm not saying this Absolutely. just because I work for Adobe. Like I genuinely think that this new mask integration just really can take your editing to the next level. And it's so helpful. Okay. And I'll show you my process with what I do with masks. Okay. It can be a little intimidating, but once you get the hang of it, it's actually pretty easy to do. Okay. So for landscape, what I like to do is I like to enhance more the highlights and the shadows. So one of the coolest things that you can do is um, do a select sky, okay? So I'm gonna do select sky right now. And again, Lightroom is gonna work that magic and check this out, okay? So it, it still blows it, my mind every I time, know, it's, it's so good. It's crazy, like it knows exactly where the sky is. Before I used to have to do this manually with like a linear grid and then brush it out, but yeah. it did a pretty good job in just targeting the sky and you can see that because it's red, okay? so. I do like to label these masks because the more I do, the more I just kind of keep want to keep track of what's what. So I'm going to call this sky. Now let me show you something cool. Okay. Now I want to target the, uh, the foreground instead of the sky. So there's not really an option that uh, gives you a foreground, but what you can do is you can duplicate sky. Okay. I'm going to call this foreground. And now what you can do is you can invert the mask. Okay. So I'm going to invert it and boom, check that out. Now it knows to get everything but the sky. And look, it even it even got this tree up here, which is crazy. Like, look look how well it targets these little things against the contrast of the sky. Again, like brushing this was just a yeah. whole nother thing before, and it was very tedious. And then you would have to do like Luma masks to try and target different colors. But just like that, within like you saw that 30 seconds, I'm now targeting the foreground 
uh, sorry, the foreground and the sky, okay? So let's work with the sky first. And I know it's the sky because I labeled it. You know, label your mass here, it's gonna be very easy, okay? Now what I like to do is I like, let me take O so I can see your adjustments. I wanna bring the highlights down just a little more, just to bring out more of that information, okay? And you can see it's really accentuating uh, the fire burning here in this in this clouds, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you know, I could turn these on and off. So boom, boom. It's just giving it kind of it's giving it some natural contrast that I really like. Okay. And then I'm gonna go with the foreground, and then I'm gonna actually increase the shadows just a little more. Okay. So we're gonna increase them. I don't want to do them too much, right? I think that's a little too much. It's just like wow. Okay, these rocks are really bright. I get it. Okay. So again, just subtly <laughs> is the key here. Okay. So I'm just gonna bring them up a little more. Um, and now we're going to go back to the video that I talked about is kind of leading elements. Okay. One of the cool things about photography and one of the things that I think really expanded my knowledge of it to get is just kind of looking for leading elements and kind of painting this picture on where you want the eyeball to go. Okay. So the cool thing about photography is you still have a lot of uh, say in the final image and kind of like adjusting with burning and dodging and all different types of mask and painting a picture to tell your audience, where do I want those eyes to go? Okay. And again, you can see here, like I, I kind of framed it so that these rocks you kind of natural, if you follow the natural formation of these rocks, it was going to end right here on the sky. And I was just counting on this, just going all the way over there and it didn't happen, but that's okay. I mean, all the elements are still here. Okay. So these rocks are kind of making your eye paint over here. Here's the sky. I really like this area right here. Um, so let's let's actually enhance that a little bit so we can really tell the eyeballs where to go. Okay, let me uh, here one sec. I want to turn my Slack notifications off so that we don't see messages. I think it's kind of crazy too with these uh, adjustments and with the masking properties in Lightroom. How if Photoshop and Lightroom weren't both Adobe. Uh, products, I feel like Photoshop would be a little worried because I had, there's so many times when before these masking properties got as advanced as they are now and with sky replacement and with these, uh, just these linear gradients being super, super accurate. I very rarely take my photos. Um, and Paco, I'm curious to kind of hear your thoughts into Photoshop because you can do so much just right here on your, on your photos. You can basically edit the entire photo right here in Lightroom without any adjustments into Photoshop. Yeah, and I think that's one of the cool things about Lightroom, right, is you can do all of it here. Uh, the, you know, Photoshop still does shine in ways that there are certain things you can't do in Lightroom, like uh, that you can do in Photoshop. But for me, I mean, I'm using Lightroom for like 98% of my landscape. Um, okay, cool. So where were we? We are going to uh, kind of tell our audience where we want the eyeball to go. Okay, so another thing I like to do is... You know, you can you can do an easy way out for this through a vignette, right? Where like if you do this, I kind of want to center more here, and you can see that it kind of did it naturally. But again, I, I like all the control in my like dodging and burning, where I don't want to just do this. This is an easy out. I used to do this a lot, but I've just kind of learned. I just kind of leaned more towards like natural uh, linear gradient. So I'm gonna center the the eye line more towards the center because I kind of want the eyes to like follow here and then go to this rock and then lead it to right here where this magic mm -hmm. is happening right here, okay? So I'm going to add a linear gradient and I'm gonna do it in this way a little bit, okay? And I'm holding shift as I'm dragging it out so that it's straight. And again, red is where it's affecting this photo, okay? And then I'm gonna hit O to turn that off so I can see what the adjustment is happening. And I'm gonna turn down the exposure just a little bit, okay? So I'll call this left burn. Now, when you're dodging and burning, burning is making things darker, dodging is making things pop. Okay, so that's why I call it left burn, right? And I'm gonna do one over here just to, you know, I th there's good foreground elements here, but I think this is kind of irrelevant, the, this part of the photo. So I'm gonna create another linear gradient and then just do this, okay? And what's cool about these is if you extend them out, you can see the feathering. You see how it just blends in more with the red. You're kind of increasing the feathering on this, or you can make it very compact and then move this forward and you can see the feathering will be more intense here. And it doesn't really um, kind of feather out like if you were to do this. So I do want to keep some of the feathering right here, but I do kind of want to burn a little bit of this. So I'm going to turn the exposure down here. Okay. And then we'll call this 
bottom burn. And then I'm going to do one more on the right side. So we'll create a new mask, create a linear gradient, and do the same thing here. Let's get this little mask panel out of the way. And I really wanted to feather this out because I think, you know, I want it to go boop. It's kind of where I want the eye line to go. Okay, so we'll go ahead and expose this down. Cool. And again, um, I'll show you the difference that this makes. So we can toggle these on and off. Mm. Right? Again, it's it's very subtle, but you know you'll you'll see that all these things start coming together. Okay, so I'll that's, show you that how that seems to that seems to be the key to not to not to cut you off there, Paco, but the subtleness mm -hmm. uh, of editing a photo like this. And this comes with experience of being out in the field, shooting a lot of these photos, trying different things, being in Lightroom, uh, experimenting on styles of your edit. And I think the subtler, the better in most cases. And you mentioned something earlier about just being able to recreate what you saw with your eye. And I yeah. think that again, goes back to what we talked about earlier for this being earth day. Like we, you, you as the photographer and the artist want to show somebody else exactly what you saw, um, maybe with like a heightened, a heightened lens, so to speak. Right. Yeah. That's, that's my ethos. And what I always keep in mind when I'm editing my photography is I don't want to overdo it. Right. Um, I do like to just kind of recreate what I remember, what I remember seeing in my eye. Right. That's the beautiful thing about um, just editing photos your own style. That's how I do it. And other people like to do it other ways. And again, there's no right or wrong answers. It's yeah. just how you like to do it. And that's just kind of how I like to do it. I like to be subtle, but you know, I like to add these little elements to really kind of like paint that picture and have your eyes follow that. Okay. Can, um, can right. I, uh, can I stop you there real quick, Paco? Just yeah, because that's, I think that's the perfect segue into how you like to do things is a little bit different. Uh, especially with this stream, we've seen something a little bit more original and a little different, which, uh, it seems like everybody in the chat has really enjoyed. I myself have enjoyed it as well. Um, and I just wanted to, we're about an hour into the stream. We have an hour left. So again, for those that are just tuning in, we are joined by Paco Siller. Uh, who is an incredible landscape photographer and he is taking us way, way into the weeds of his process. Uh, and we're just sitting back and enjoying the show on this beautiful Wednesday. Uh, that being said, if you are watching uh, over on Behance, make sure to join the chat, ask our questions, and uh, there will be a replay on the Adobe Creative Cloud YouTube channel as well. Um, so just, just wanted to stop there and make sure that we address that. Um, one other thing, Paco, I did want to set you up because I know that uh, we had mentioned a surprise at the end of the stream. The fact that we are an hour into this, I wanted to give you sort of the floor to uh, maybe before you get into your next part of the editing process. Uh, I know you had another sort of special treat for us in terms of uh, some money that you're trying to raise uh, awareness around Earth Day. And so maybe oh, okay. you can kind of just uh, just hit on that a little bit as you're as you're going through your process. I didn't want to. Uh, miss yeah. That uh, thanks for bringing that up, James. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, so this is Earth Day, right? And, you know, we all love awareness of Earth Day. It's part of the reason why we're doing this. Um, you know, everybody can put like hashtags for awareness, all that. That's all good. It's, it's all bringing it into the light. But I'm a big fan of action, right? So I think if we take that a little bit step further and actually do a little more, we can sort of just really start to snowball and make a difference. So something that I'm doing, this is personal, right? It's, it's outside of Adobe, is I'm just doing a fundraiser on GoFundMe, okay? And it is a Earth Day fundraiser, okay? And it's gonna go to a nonprofit uh, that's called the Clean Air Task Force, which I've done my due diligence, I follow with them. Their impact for how much they can get through donations, it's actually a lot. They're one of the few nonprofits that are vouched for by Going Green, which kind of evaluates all these different nonprofits for environment and sees their high impact per dollar and also the Founders Pledge, which is pretty big. Um, so yeah, I encourage you all to just kind of have a look at this. Um, the, the goal here is not to be like, let's raise $500. Let's raise $300. Honestly, don't care how much money you donate. I think more so what I'm looking for is just, you know, just doing something right. If you donate a dollar, yeah. if you donate $5, whatever, I don't care, but it, it at least just kind of sparks something where you're just taking some action towards something that means so much for us, um, and this planet. Right, so I'm starting a fundraiser. If you all want to donate to this fundraiser, go ahead and do it. Um, you know, this doesn't go to me. This goes literally directly to the organization. Once you donate, you'll get an email saying that PayPal sent it to the Clean Air Task Force. Um, so I just did this of kind of way like, hey, if you want some quick action, if you want to do something super quickly, go ahead and go to this fundraiser and just donate. And then something that I, um, that's something cool that I'm doing is anybody who donates, 
um, can actually get a free digital copy of this photo that we're going to finish editing. So, you know, awesome. you saw how I captured the photo. You're seeing the process of how we're editing. And when I'm finished with it, um, if you want a digital copy of it to, you know, print it out, set it as a desktop background or whatever, as kind of a thank you for donating, um, you can actually go down here to the contact button. Let me know that you've donated and then I'll just email you a uh, digital copy of this photo that we're going to finish. And again, I don't know what the final edit's going to be. Uh, we're going to figure it out in the live That's the beautiful thing of you all watching it with us. You know, you can sort of... Yeah. Uh, choose the path of how this edit's going to go, and it's going to be a photo that's co uh, created by all of us. Okay. Awesome. So awesome. again, well, um, I you. encourage you all. To, I encourage you all to check this out. Um, again, if you don't want to donate, if you want to donate to your own nonprofit that you do it, go for it. This is just an easy way to be like, oh, here's one. Let me just hit donate. Um, and then yeah. So that's what we're doing. Thanks thank for you. That up, well, James. thank you. Yeah, uh, I'll do on the side. Thank you, Paka. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much yeah. for for that. And again, like just because we are uh, working through these these edits and these two days uh, around Earth Day and everything is themed around Earth Day, uh, I feel like I need to just make sure that I'm voicing my opinion as well as someone who uh, basically has lived outside for two or three years in a van. Uh, the leave no trace principles are huge uh, in Big what one. we do and Paco exploring these places and anyone who's getting out this spring, this summer with the weather getting nice uh, and with people starting to travel again, it is extremely important to take care of these beautiful places and leave no trace principles is exactly what it sounds like. Go in uh, and come out with what you brought in. Uh, do not leave garbage, trash, plastic. Again, plastic free is extremely important. Um, and I think Paco, what you're doing for that donation, uh, I will be pledging a donation as well to that just because I, I believe in the cause. I believe in, in, uh, in protecting this planet. So uh, I awesome. know that was a little Thank bit of a, a detour from what you're working on, but it had to be mentioned. And again, for those that are out there enjoying this beautiful planet this week, you know, enjoy it. Uh, do not take it for granted. And uh, hopefully 100%. you can learn how to take an amazing landscape photography if you sit tight for the next hour and watch Paco's genius. So that being said, all you, man, hop let's back, back, hop into, back it. into it. Cool. Um, all right. So the next thing I wanted to do is let's get into some dodging and burning with some brushes. Okay. So I'm going to create yet another mask. This time we'll do a brush. And what I want to do is I kind of want to hide some of the elements that are um, shining out to us, again, to kind of like play with that contrast. Okay, so when you dodge and burn, you're kind of bringing up in exposure elements and then you're bringing down in exposure other elements. And that contrast really helps in really accentuating the places of interest that you want to brush. Okay, so we're going to start by uh, doing some burning and there's actually a preset. If you go here to effect, you can go down to burn, which is darken. And then once I start painting, oh, let's hit O so I know um, where I'm painting. Oops, I did undid all that. So let's go ahead and do that again. These shortcuts okay, are so helpful too. I know, I'm, I'm telling you, the more you use the apps, the more you're gonna wanna use shortcuts. It's just gonna make your life so much easier. Um, okay, so I'm gonna just start brushing away some of the elements that I kind of wanna hide, but also, uh, contrast with other elements it's that beautiful balance of light and dark that i think can really bring out photos so i'm gonna go ahead and just brush out these areas on the sides you know because i'm again i'm really aiming to have the eye line go to this middle part where you have these really cool bright rocks and then kind of lead towards here okay so i'm gonna go ahead and brush these out when you also uh, play Paco, with wait, the, when uh, you're thinking when you're thinking about this edit as a whole, right? Like you're thinking about this landscape photograph. I imagine because you're shooting it in landscape, you're thinking about it being uh, a print or, you know, framed or on a website. And in this case, because you have that eye line that you're setting up going directly down the center of the frame, are you also taking into consideration what it may look like on Instagram as a vertical format too? You're a smart man, James. Yes, I'm gonna get into that. So oh. I do like to make my edits on the wide shot first. And that's also another reason why I like to shoot in the landscape format instead of the portrait is because you can actually crop it out to become portrait. So if you go portrait, you can't really go landscape, but if you go landscape, you can go portrait. Uh, so, you know, this can easily be a print, but again, if this, I think if this shot, if I gotten more color over here, then I probably would have kept this as a landscape portrait or sorry, landscape uh, shot. But since I know this is really where the interest is in this middle, um, in the back of my mind, I already know that I'm gonna end up cropping this uh, towards a portrait style and kind of just really keeping these elements here. But I do cool. like to just do the global elements on the full frame shot, the full landscape shot, 
And then when I crop it, um, I can kind of adjust that. Okay. Cause I do like to just have like all that data, everything edited, and then I'll just crop it in. Okay. And again, I don't awesome. do this for every shot. I just, I just know for the specific one, that's where I'm leaning more towards just because of how it came out. Okay. Um, whoops, I clicked the wrong one. Okay. So let's go ahead and just brush this in a little bit. Um, just to kind of talk about the brush tool real quick. Uh, you have flow, right? If you go to 100%, it's going to make it really red. Okay. So that's that's okay. But again, my, my, my whole thing is subtly, right? So I'm going to hit Z. And then when you go to flow, let's say we bring it to 30. Each time I do a stroke, it gets redder and redder. Okay. So I just kind of like to just brush it in very subtly, very fine. So it's not just like this huge stamp of burn. Okay. So I'll do this a little more down here. Or more down here. Now this is probably where Wacom comes into play, but still haven't pulled right. the trigger on one of those. I'm using the hey, good that, old trackpad. I feel like this this sets it up pretty well though to just use your mouse because I'm not I'm not a Wacom guy. Uh, I know a lot of people that are, but that flow tool, right? The flow, the feather, the density, all that yeah. really helps um, get exactly what you're looking for. And for you specifically with that subtle nature, uh, being able to just paint like like any artist would, you know, over your over your canvas. Yeah. And this is, you know, this is super therapeutic, right? Like you have an awesome shot or an awesome shoot day outdoors. Um, you're already outside. So it's a win for me. It doesn't matter if the shoot came out great or not. I was outdoors. So it's a W. It's a W for me. And then you come back and then you just edit the photos, right? And like each photo is different, right? Like the adjustments and all these brushing for this photo is very specific for this photo. Okay. And each one is its own adventure. So that's, that's what I love about all the different shoots that we do. Okay. Um, all right. So right now, all this brushing that I did, even though I oh, hold on, set it to burn. Okay. So by hitting the burn key, it just turned that exposure down by 0.3. And again, it's it's all about that subtly, right? You know, I don't want to go intense because that just does not look right, obviously. So just make it make it subtle, right? Like at a 0.38. Okay. Now I'm gonna balance this uh, burning out with some dodging. Okay. So I'm really gonna have those. Uh, the burning and dodging kind of complement each other by like having some next to it. So let me title this one. We'll call it burn. Let's do burn brush. So we know that this is a brush. Okay. And then I'll create a new mask and then we'll do another brush. Okay. And then I'll start brushing. So it knows what's happening. And this time I'm going to go to dodge. As you can see, a dodge had increased it by 0.25. Okay. So I'll just kind of start highlighting in and I, and I'm, I want to go subtle here. Okay. Cause this is, these are already bright rocks, right? Like I don't want to make them super bright. And again, it's that whole mantra of just like subtly subtle, yep. subtleness is the key. Right. And I really do want to paint them here. So I'm going to make it a little darker over here. Cause I really do want the eye to kind of lead towards these rocks here. I feel like it's always good too, to, you had done it earlier. And I feel like I'm constantly doing the before and after uh, oh, shortcuts yeah. because I can forget very easily. Like there's been plenty of times where I'll get really carried away with an edit and then I'll do the before and after and be like, oh man, I actually, I liked the way it was shot raw and I did too much to that image or maybe I didn't do enough. And so that tool is a really good way to, to sort of keep yourself in check too. 100%. Um, cool. So here, let me just show you the difference this makes. So there's that and there's that. Okay. So again, I'm just kind of giving hints on where to look. Okay. So right there, I really like that. Cause it's just I really like the burn brush. Cause over here, I just don't think it's, it's that big of a part of the photo. So I'm just kind of hiding that a little bit and I'm mm -hmm. complimenting it with just a little more light. Right. And again, I'll, I'll show you the whole before and after. Okay. Right. So this is, this is how we started and look where we're at. Crazy. Wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Nuts. Okay, and then looking at the burn brush, I do actually want to mask this rock just a little more. So let me bring up O to see where all these adjustments are taking place. And I think you mentioned this in your video, but do you have any, um, this is just out of curiosity and for anyone in the chat who's who's looking to really get out there and shoot sunset or sunrise, do you have any good apps that you use to track um, the direction of where that sun is going to be falling, maybe where the night sky or certain stars will be. I do. I, I actually have one that I shouted out in the, um, in the video. It's kind of a funky name and I did pay for it, uh, but I do think it's worth it. It's called the photographers F Maris. 
Um, you know what? I'm going to do a demonstration of this if we have time because I do want to show this app. But I actually do use this app a lot to plan uh, sunset shoots, especially in places that I haven't been before. Because it'll tell me where that sun is going to come in from. And again, I mean, you always want to be looking where you think that color is going to be and where that sun is setting. So right. you know, I'm not that type of person that I can look at the stars and be like, that's north, that's west, that's east. I'm not there yet. And I think technology has made it very easy for us. Um, but this app definitely helps. And it'll tell you too, it's pretty cool. It keeps in mind uh, elevation. So let's say that you hike up to this beautiful place in Yosemite, um, but then there's still a bunch of uh, granite cliffs. And then it'll tell you that, hey, you're not going to see the sun because it's going to be hiding behind a mountain. So very useful mm -hmm. app. Um, if we have time, remind me, James, um, I'll plug cool. in my phone and then I'll actually show you that app. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, cool. So we were looking at brushing. This is Dodge Brush. Okay. All right, so this is looking good. Okay, I'm already liking how this is looking. Um, all right, and then I want to do one more thing, right? I think I think the uh, the money in the shot is kind of this like beautiful like painted sun cloud thing. So I just do yeah. want to accentuate that just a little more. So here's a cool trick. All right, we're gonna create a mask, and then this time we're gonna use a radio filter. Okay. Uh, no, oh, I did the foreground. Hold on. Command Z that. I want to create a new mask. Let's see, radial. There we go. Okay. Uh, and then again, where the red is, that's where this is taking place. Okay. And then I'm just going to just highlight where all that color is taking place. Okay. And I have a I have a question uh, for those two uh, ellipses, I guess, in that radial. So there's one in the center, mm -hmm. and then there's one on the outside, right? So if you turn, if you pull that one on the outside, is that just making that radial larger? And then the yeah, inside is the feather right. tool, or are those both sort of the same? Yeah, it's kind of showing you thing? where the yeah where the most amount that the effect is going to take place is inside the circle, right? And then you can extend its reach uh, by like extending this outer circle. So again, it's like the feathering. That's happening, cool. All right? So I'm gonna do something like this, and I called it some pop, and you'll see why. It's because I'm just gonna really ac accentuate that orange by just moving that um, the white balance to the right to make it warmer, okay? And then you'll see that. So that's kind of the before and the after, and I think that's really paying some good compliments to these clouds that were just getting a hint of sun, but now we're really showing it like, yeah, the sun is glowing there, okay? So again, let's look at the before and the after here. Let's get rid of all this stuff. Yeah, so I think that's looking pretty darn good. That looks awesome. Yeah, and it's it's yeah. nice too because it has a, you now have a bit of this contrast between the blue and because you brought out that that radial, you know, sun pop uh, filter, if you will there, it's creating that really nice warm and cool look in one photo. So I think it looks awesome. Yeah, I think it's looking great. Um, okay, so let me work with the crop a little bit. Because, you know, I don't like this tree just kind of hanging out here. It just seems kind of irrelevant to the composition. So I'm going to hold shift and resize this so it maintains the aspect ratio. And then look at this. These are our friends, the rule of thirds, <laughs> right? So this is something that I talked about in the video. And again, the goal here is to kind of line up these intersecting points with some points of interest, right? So I'm definitely going to line this up, uh, this top left one, to where this... Um, this magic is happening, which I think is one of the cool par coolest parts of the photo, right? And then, you know, the other, mo again, if, if that sun just hit these clouds, this other uh, intersecting ah. point would have really shined here. You know, that was kind of the whole goal here. But again, that's okay. I mean, this photo still looks pretty darn good in my opinion, okay? Looks awesome. And then the other intersecting points, I think, are these foreground elements, okay? So in the video, I mentioned foreground elements, okay? That's why I really wanted these rocks in here. And I've, I've made this... Um, mistake before when I was first shooting is I would just shoot open water with no foreground elements. So like, let's say I had this photo and the sky was here, was looking amazing, but I just had some open water. That photo is not going to look as interesting or as eye appealing if I did not have these foreground elements. Trust me, especially with wide angled landscape photography, you really want to match up a foreground to complement the background. Okay. I've shot many times, especially like Lake Tahoe is huge. You know, I shot it and you just have like just water, water that goes to like something that you want to see in the background, but it's just too far. 
right? So yeah. you want to have some foreground element that complements the background element. And that's kind of the whole thing that I was talking about in the video with just foreground elements, leading elements, and using all of these things that you know to really compose that shot. Okay. Yeah. And I want to, I want to just continue to stress that too, Paco, because you, you did such a great job in the video and, and clearly on these photos where, where composition is the first thing you're thinking about. And I think it's very easy as eager photographers to be in a situation where we show up late to a sunset and we're rushing to get that shot. And exactly all we see is a reflective lake and we're like, cool, double reflection or just, just water. And you, there's a lot of thought that goes into it. And uh, the composition is what you lead with. And you can shoot that with an iPhone. Again, like going back to the gear, you don't need the craziest gear to compose an image like this. You have to have the thought in mind to know how to compose an image using the rule of thirds. So um, that can't be stressed enough. Yeah. And I, I see that Hayne says, why don't you remove three branches in the upper right? Uh, we're on the same, <laughs> we're in the same mind, we're, my friend. I didn't even see that comment until before I, uh, before I did that, but I agree. Yeah. The three branches are um, disturbing. I don't think they add to the photo. So that's why we're going to crop them out. Okay. So here we go. So that's looking better. Okay. And again, we're, we're sticking to this rule of thirds. Okay. So cool. This is, again, this photo is looking pretty good. So again, this That's is kind awesome. of the raw HDR, and then this is after all our adjustments, okay? Uh, now, so James, you did mention that we wanted to make this portrait, and I think that's kind of the goal here. So um, what I'm gonna do now, and this is pretty cool that Lightroom does, is you're gonna make a, or I'm gonna make a virtual copy. So I don't know what crazy magic Lightroom does, but when you make a virtual copy, it's not actually making a new file that takes up space. It's just this virtual copy that lives in Lightroom. It's kind of wild. Um, so. I'm going to go ahead and do that by right clicking and go into create virtual copy. Okay. And so there we it's go. almost like Lightroom's version of proxy files that still yeah. act as a high res file, but you know, Lightroom's version of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's pretty cool what it does. So now I have a virtual copy independent of the one we just did. It's not going to affect it. Uh, but this is the one that I want to turn into a portrait style photo. Okay. So let me show you something cool and that I discovered, okay? Let's say that we wanna go uh, four by five because we wanna upload to Instagram, All right? So if we go to, let's see, Instagram aspect ratios, you know, there's all these different um, types of aspect ratios. Like, you know, this one does a good one. So as you can see here, come on, load up. All right, well, that one's taking a while. So you can see there's different yeah. types of, you know, you have nine by 16 for portrait, you have four by five, right? But you can see four by five um, is a pretty narrow square, right? So let me show you what happens if I just hit four by five, oh, that's eight by five, four by five in Lightroom, right? It doesn't really get it that narrow, okay? So it's, it's gonna still crop out if you upload to something like Instagram at four by five. So what the hack is, is to really get that four by five portrait style is to unlock uh, the aspect ratio and then scoot this in right and now when you go back to four by five It's gonna actually do four by five But in the true fashion that would go to Instagram where it's not gonna crop anything, right? So this is now my new frame that I want to use for that Okay So let's go ahead and extend this And I remember how I talked about in the rule of thirds where you want to match it to the intersecting points um uh, Again, these are guidelines, these are rules. They don't necessarily have to be followed, but it's good to know these so that you can break these rules. Okay, because now what I wanna do is I wanna center this awesome sky thing in between this intersecting points because I want it to be centered now, but I'm gonna put everything else of interest to the outside of it. But I kinda want the eye to go straight in the middle. So it's not necessarily in this intersecting points anymore. I just want it to be in the middle. And I think that's gonna look a lot better, okay? So, here we go. So in, a, so in a way you've created like two different uh, intersecting points, one on that landscape shot where the center of the frame is a little bit different than now what it is in a four by five aspect ratio, just because there's so much going on. Uh, Cause you could have very easily just said, okay, here's my four by five crop. I'm gonna slap it right on the same leading lines that my landscape was, but it wouldn't have the same leading lines and the image would be a little confused. Yeah. 100%. Uh, so again, let me just center this a little more, okay? Now that I've done that, I might make just a little more adjustments on it to, to go with this um, this new framing. So I do wanna 
accentuate this a little more. So let me hit O to get rid of that. And let's just bring just a little more. There we go. See, now I'm really forcing your eye to skip this and then go straight here and then really go towards this magic right here, okay? Paco, can uh, you, uh, I think this would be cool to show um, just because you were talking about that leading line. When you're in the crop mode, um, mm -hmm. and I think it's O, isn't it? There's a key, there's a specific keyboard shortcut that shows you the different overlays or R. So if you uh, click through them. I Yeah, I've seen that before. I it, forget how to show that. So um, if anybody knows, it, throw it in the chat. And I think what might be, do, do you know about the Fibonacci spiral? Yeah, I think yep. I think this composition might be complementing the Fibonacci spiral a little more. So that's what I was like, that's what I was kind of getting at. I think on yeah. my I might have my keyboard shortcuts set up a little bit differently because I think when I press O, I bring up all of those overlays in Lightroom and then it funnels through each one. Um, pressing, yeah, in the develop module. So mine, yeah. So it says O or Z, maybe it's zero, um, and then it see. brings up while you're in the crop tool the different. Um, yeah, I think so while my, you're there, oh, there we there go. You go. Okay. There we go. Yeah. So you'll see that spiral, which I think your f uh, photo totally lends itself almost like an inverse. It's an inverse of that. Yeah. Which is very you know, cool. It's kind of so doing, this is, yeah, this, I mean, it kind of complements this. I don't know what this one is. I haven't used this one, but you know, I think it would follow the same principles as leading lines. So here's one and then here's another, right? Right. So again, these are just guides. Um, they can help. And they absolutely do help if you don't know how to frame anything. Um, but, you know, guides can be broken. And I just, I you know, I absolutely. upload on Instagram a lot. And I just know that when you're looking at it on a mobile phone, you're just really paying attention to what's centered. So that's kind of why I'm centering this. All right. Um, cool. Okay. I did want to just um, dodge this just a little more. Um, just to really, really kind of hone in that uh, leading eye thing. So let's see. That's why we label them because I know it's dodge. There we go. Let's increase this flow just a little more. Maybe just here on the tip. So this is in Lake Tahoe, uh, Paco? This is Lake Tahoe, or yeah. This, this is, is Lake on Tahoe. the east side. Um, so Lake Tahoe, if you look at it on a map, it's actually in the middle of the border of two states. So Lake Tahoe, is literally in California and Nevada at the same time. Mm. Um, so I don't know, you know when you go to, when you go to the east side, you're in Nevada. Uh, but you know that's usually where I like to go for photography because when you look to the west, that's where the sun's going to set. So this part is one of many many picturesque spots in Lake Tahoe. One of the most um, picturesque ones is called Sand Harbor, and that's like a lot further up no uh, north, and it's just. It's so crowded. Like everybody goes oh, to wow. Sand Harbor, but there's a reason why. Like there we go. Wow. Okay, this is where you really see the blue water. So I actually have not done a shoot here because I want to do it during the week when it's not just overcrowded. Because if you go there on the weekends, it's game over. Uh, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean the, I'm sure. the east side of Tahoe has some very very picturesque um, photos. So, oh, I've oh, only been I've only been to Tahoe in the winter. I feel ashamed to say it, and it just looks so beautiful any other time of the year. So I'm. I'm definitely going to make my way out there and maybe we can go shoot that together. That'd be fun. Let's do it. You and Anna are welcome anytime, my friend. Um, okay, so let's go to Dodge. Just bring it a little bit over here. Okay. Um, all right, maybe let's just brush this in a little more here. And I actually do want to take some of the burn in this one. What's cool is if you hold option, you see how this is a plus sign, you're adding brush strokes. Um, if you hold option, then you actually take it away, right? So mm. I'm actually going to take it away. Because this worked for the landscape one, but I think for this portrait one, I do want it to be a little brighter. Yeah, there we go. I'm kind of liking how that's looking. Cool. Um, all right. So this, this is looking pretty good. I, I would say, uh, you know, as a photo edit, um, I do like how this is looking, but we're going to take this photo one step further and I'll tell you where the inspiration came from, right? So if we go to, where's my T7 drive? Here we go. Uh, let's see. Paco, you were just chock, reference. you were just chock full of surprises today, man. This is, <laughs> what a wait, fun one. there's more. Okay. So <laughs> wait, what I love, what I love in, um, 
just traveling and outdoors it's kind of like these uh like picturesque travel posters you get right and this is kind of where yeah. i draw the inspiration from right you know this is it's an oh this is its own art it's like a vector illustration right so there is actually a cool way to sort of imitate this in photoshop and i'm going to show you how okay so we're going to take this into photoshop now full disclosure i am not a photoshop guru like i am with like lightroom or premiere after effects you know when people talk about like what languages they speak like oh i speak photoshop after effects i'm like you know, I'm elementary with Photoshop, so might have some hiccups, but I've done this enough to like kind of navigate around it. But let's dive into the world of Photoshop. So I'm going to right click and here's the cool thing about Adobe Creative Cloud. You can just kind of cross work with all the apps. So right click, go to edit in Photoshop 2022. Oh man. And of course, Tim comes in. Did somebody mention Photoshop? Now, Tim, Tim is a guru of Photoshop. He is our very own Content producer and studio <laughs> manager in EMEA. So that means um, in the European side of the world. Well, yeah. Welcome, Tim. He heard Photoshop and he just came. Uh, he just came pops running. up. You know, some say if you say <laughs> He's Photoshop like, Did someone times. say Photoshop? I have my cape on. <laughs> yeah. You know, some say if you mentioned uh, Photoshop three times, you will. Tim will just pop up out of nowhere. <laughs> okay. All right. So again, I'm going to get into the habit of just naming my layer. So I'm just going to call this the reference image. Boom. Okay. Now check this out. This is very cool. This is actually something that came out, I think last year during Adobe Max. So this is fresh off the press and we're going to mess with something called neural filters. All right. So I'm going to go to filter and then I'm going to go to neural filter. I've actually never used these. So this is going to be, yeah, I, this is something, um, I get this, this is the beautiful thing about these streams is I was hosting um, Christy Odom, who is a insanely talented naturalist photographer. Um, she's super cool. Check out her work. Uh, but this is something that she wanted to highlight during uh, Max when I was hosting her. And then I started playing around with it. And I'm like, man, this is just insane. So what you can do is you can transfer the style of paintings onto an image that you have. Okay. So I'll show you what I mean by that. Like, let's say, you know, these are very famous photographs. Can't say their names for obvious reasons, uh, but it does transfer their style. So this is crazy. All right. This is a little Whoa. too much. But um, again, the this is kind of the mantra with the editing that I do is subtle is the key. Okay. So right now it's taking the colors of this specific style, um, which I don't want that. I want my own colors that I took in this photo. So I'm going to go ahead and hit preserve color. And then it's going to keep the colors that were in the shot. And then we're going to turn down the opacity because this is too intense, I think. All right. But you'll see. Okay. Now it's starting to turn the photo I took into um, that style. Right. And there's all these different ones to play with. So I think, you know, I like this one, but I'm not a big fan of what's going on with like up here. You know, it just didn't seem to transfer there. We can do it and then add a layer mask to it and then brush that stuff out, which we may get to. Uh, but let's just see what other ones look like. Okay. Okay, so this one's looking cool, right? Mm, that's cool. You know, if we go I like, to 100 the, I like strength, the geometric kind of triangular shapes that you're getting from that too. Yeah, okay. So this, you know, it's taken a lot of the inspiration of these mountains. So again, you know, you can you can definitely mess with this, right? Like, oh, sorry, I think it was the opacity that by default goes to 100. And then on, yeah, look, oh, okay. So this is some abstract stuff, man. Oh, like, wow. you know, you could, really, you could really play around with this stuff, right? And make it look super cool. So, you know, if you turn the strength down, I'll get rid of more of these like shades. So that, you know, that's looking cool. You know, I mean, I think it's a little too much, but you know, we can turn down the opacity and really work with it. Okay. So that's cool. So I'm going to keep this. Okay. And then I'm going to do a new layer. Okay, cool. And then the way I do it, and again, I don't know, like this may not be the best practice of Photoshop, but it works for me because I'm a Photoshop newbie, but I'm going to add a layer mask in case I want to brush some of this stuff out. Okay. And then on top of this, we're going to stack these neutral or neural filters. We're going to add another one. Okay. So we're going to go back to style transfer and here's the cool thing. So you have artist styles, which, you know, gives you, let's see, that's about 10 different things to choose from. But if you go to image styles, you have so many more. Okay. So it's fun to combine these and play with them and just kind of see what um, type of image you can make by just stacking neural filters. And again, it's all Photoshop. Mm -hmm. So you can make it non-destructive and kind of tweak it to your will. 
right? So um, one of them that I like, let's see how this one looks. Ooh, the Taj, I think. The Taj Mahal. Um, Paco, can you, and you may be getting to this already as you're stacking them, but if you really, really en enjoy that sort of artistic style that you showed us earlier, um, would you be able to bring like a sample reference yes. of that in yes, here? Yes, you can. And oh yeah, you can go to custom and then you can go to select image and then do one, okay? Wow, um, cool. So I've done that before with other ones, um, you know, Something you want to think about, like you can definitely get the inspiration from that, but obviously don't copy it 100%. Uh, but it does help to have very high quality images, right? So some of the images you get online, they might be a little low, uh, low res and rightfully so, because people obviously don't want them to take that. But if you take your own photo outside, you know, then you can reference that and then turn it into some sort of painting, right? Cool. So there's definitely a lot to work with here. So this one, again, I want to preserve the color because I don't want to keep the styles that come from that. But let's see what happens when I preserve my color. Okay, so that's kind of cool. You know, again, super Ooh, intense. That's cool. Let's turn down the opacity. All right, so Ooh. this is this is starting to look kind of like those inspirational posters we're looking at, right? So let me let me keep this one. So, okay, we'll add a new layer mask in case we want to brush out. So, you know, so there's one, there's two, and then there's the image, right? It's just so cool that it's like being a kid again, really playing around in in just paint and, and crafts and like seeing this come together puts a smile on my face because it really brings another element to this image that you work so hard on, but then you're creating a style that you're influenced by just out of uh, these neural filters, right. which... Yeah, I'm kind of blown away, and it seems like a lot of other people in the chat are are as well. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, and this is you know that you know some might say like, oh, you're ruining your photo, and I would say, yeah, you could, or you could be complimenting, right? Like it's it's all right. different styles again. Like there's no right or wrong answer. Like I've actually done this to make some posters um, that I really like how they look. So again, it's you know I don't like to go super intense. I do like to be subtle with these. So you know I think what we're gonna do next is we're gonna try and add some text to it and like really. So that travel uh, poster print, right? But before we do that, let's just see how one more neural filter looks. Whoops, I added a mask on top of a mask. That's not what I want. Okay, let's go to filter. Let's go to neural filters. Let's just transfer one more style just to see what's going on here. Okay. Oh, this one's funny. Let's see how this would look. <laughs> yeah. <that laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, that's goodness. a lot. But it, it's a lot when you have it up on all the sliders, but then wow. you don't realize like when, again, going back to that subtle nature, you pull it down and you're like, oh, okay, like this could work. Yeah, you know, it's kind of in the same vein, like when you're working with LUTs, like in videography, you could yep. slap on a LUT or like a preset, you know, especially in Lightroom, you have different presets, like, you know, the Visco presets were pretty big back in the day. You know, you could do it and call it done. You know, I would always say, use that as inspiration, maybe as like a base layer and then make your own tweaks to it. Really make it your own. Right. Um, right. But, you know, for me personally, like adding those LUTs or adding those presets, it was always just too much. But what I like to do was just kind of like toning down that specific preset to 30%, then maybe adding another one and toning it down to 30% and then adding my own adjustments to it, like my own S-curve, my own color grading. And now right. you've made your own uh, preset, right? You've really made it your own. And that's what I encourage people to do, right? Is like take this stuff as inspiration you know, like this is kind of the same idea here, like style transfers, like image transfers, take little elements of everything and like make up this concoction. That's your own thing. Right. That's the cool thing. Yeah, about all this absolutely. Stuff. Absolutely. I mean, that's the great part about what we do as photographers, what you're doing as a, a photographer and a creator. And, and I think the biggest key is like the consistency of finding that style over time and, and trial and error, practicing different techniques and then continuing to put that work out there. And eventually your style sort of just becomes you become your style and your style becomes you in a way. And, and, uh, it's totally okay to branch out away from that style, but, uh, it's, it's your artistic decision, you know, and, and I'm loving the way this is really, really coming out. Paco it looks awesome. Yeah. It's very cool. All right. I think I want to slap this one on. As you're adding oh, this last one, I, like I just want one. to, uh, Ooh, Ooh, I like that a lot. Yeah. Um, I just want to remind you, Paco, I know you're kind of aware of time. You got about 20 minutes left today. Oh um, and again, for those that are in the stream, uh, joining us in the chat, make sure to ask any other questions you have for Paco today. Uh, thank you for everyone who has been very, very, uh, excited all day and, and eager to learn from 
uh, from Paco here. So get those questions in. Uh, 20 more minutes left. Yeah, 20 minutes left. Time flies. Wow. Here I'm thinking, I'm like, are we going to have enough content? Sure. Oh, yeah. Okay, that, cool. That's so never the case. Yeah, never. So let's hit okay. Um, again, for the purpose of this live stream, I just kind of want to show you how these things work. Um, I think when we get the final print, um, and that's something that I give away to go along with that fundraiser, I'm definitely going to go behind the scenes and like fine tune this stuff and you know really cater it to how um, I like it. But you know, again, I think this is a little intense. So I'd probably work with some brushing um, kind of, you know, I think there's just some texture here that I don't really want to relay that hard like this. I mean, it straight up looks like a painting. <laughs> it's, it's kind yeah, of uh, it really does. very, very impressive what Photoshop does here. But I think I would just kind of like subtly uh, mask those out. But the idea is there, you know, it's 100 In a way, there. it looks like that, in a way that like little whimsical uh, focus of your image where that light's hitting kind of looks like it's its own little mountain or a pyramid almost. And it creates that abstract it's something totally different than I than what was there previously. So I think that's kind of a yeah. cool, a cool piece. I agree, of and it's you know this whole painter feel is like really accentuating uh, this like orange sunset that we got. So right, looking very cool. Um, okay, so let me show you one more thing. There's more. I'm just throwing curveballs left and right. <laughs> so again, but we we are using we're using inspiration here. Okay, so I do like the text that comes with these travel posters, right? Especially this one. So check yeah. this out. We can go to uh, Adobe Fonts. Ba -ba -ba. Right? Explore unlimited fonts. Okay, let's search by image. So again, Photoshop is gonna work some magic and then mm. try and match what it thinks. You know, these are, these are free to use. We're not free, you gotta have a membership and you have access to all these fonts, but it will come up with, um, a font that I think you know mimics more or less the one that you show to. So let's give it this one. It's going to be scanning. I did not know that. That's really cool. Yeah, and it totally did not get it, but that's okay because we're going to tell it where that text is. Okay. So we're just they're smart, tell. but we gotta we gotta give them hold their we hand. Gotta, a we gotta little give bit. them a little little nudge, you know. Um, okay, so we'll do next step, and then it's going to find some fonts that closely relate. You know, look at that. It knows that this is Lake Tahoe. Okay. Look at oh, this, wow. you know, look at, you know, this one's kind of crazy, but like, I do like how these are looking, right? Like it's got the same feel and the yeah. same vibe as those travel posters. All right. I think I'm liking this one. Um, oh, look at this and I already have it activated. Wow. Um, you, you planned for that. Doing? I planned for that. Who would have known? <laughs> um, okay. Let's pick a new one though. I like kind of like Cubano sharp. Yeah. Let's look at the family, right? Because when you're looking at new fonts, you do want to see the different ones. So we have regular, we have sharp. Okay, let's activate the regular one. And then the sharp one. Okay. So I activated those. Those are tied to my CC membership. All right, we're going to go back here. And then let's add some text here. So I'm going to hit that text tool. Okay. And type in Lake Tahoe. Okay, let's center this bad boy up. So cool shortcut, if you hit command, let's, so the reference image, you know, all these are the same, but I wanna hit command A to get this little selection tool to get at the whole thing. And then when I hit V, uh, it's gonna take up these properties up top here. Where I, can actually, I can actually center this. So I think this is already centered surprisingly. Let's see, let's, so this is the top, this is the center, there we go. Cool, so this is centered. I know this is centered now. Okay, and then let's pick this is using Adobe Clean. We want to look for, uh, what was it, Cubano? There we go. So. Cubano. Yeah. Hey, look yeah. at that. I like how that looks. How about yeah. that? Very cool. And then let's, you know, let's give it a color. So I do like to take elements of the color palette that we have in front of it and then just kind of choose a color that I think will, will kind of go with this whole image that we have in the background, right? So you know, we can pick our eyedropper tool and maybe like go for the water. Which this could work, but then I think it's just too close of a contrast with the rock. So maybe something that gives a little more contrast, like the sun over here. Yeah, I kind of like what's going on with mm -hmm. this orange, right? Cool. Uh, maybe let's get like a more saturated orange, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Love that. And then let's say, where is Lake Tahoe, my friends? Do we know? True question. Where's Lake Tahoe? I already mentioned this. Let's see yeah, if anybody so in the those, chat knows. 
for those in the chat, where is Lake Tahoe? I will not uh, be providing the answer. So yeah. I know everyone's in there. Where is Lake yeah, Tahoe? It's kind of a trick question, <laughs> but I'm curious to know if we know. Okay. So I'll wait for you all to answer that and I'll just keep working. It's in California. So, Jen, you are half correct, my friend. Yes. You are right. It is in California, but remember, it is technically in Nevada as well. See, Andrea's right as well, but the answer is both of them. Who knew we'd be yes. getting a geography lesson, a Lightroom <laughs> lesson, a Photoshop lesson, a lesson in Paco's amazing dry humor skills. It's been quite the day, everyone. Yeah, so here's Lake Tahoe, and then this is the California side, and then this is the Nevada. So it's just funny. It just literally sits inside of two states. <laughs> Oliver said America, so t he is correct. America, I mean, you are correct. Ban Carroll, Montana. <laughs> ban Carroll, you sly dog. That's my good buddy. He has come and visited many times, so. Awesome. I, know he's I have a us. I have a quick question, Paco. While you have that map up, actually, because uh, we blew by the uh, production quality of your video that you had done, and you got a couple of comments about the animation of the map. Um, was that oh, yeah. uh, just was that just a Google Earth screen capture, or did you actually yeah. do that in After Effects? That's I you know I picked up Cinema 4D for this video. No, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> it was a screen capture of Google Earth, and you know I. I was kind of nervous about using it because it is Google. And then I actually looked up their licensing rights and they're like, yeah, feel free to use it as long as you just shout out that it's Google Earth. So that's Sweet. why when you saw the video, I shouted out that it's Google Earth. And then that's them getting the attribution that they want. And then you can just use it for um, video projects. So that's pretty Very cool. cool. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's finish this. So the reason I asked that question is because I also want to write where Lake Tahoe is. So let's um, duplicate this text. That is not what I want. Um, I thought it was Command J. It was not duplicate. Command. Well, you're select. So just go Command oh, uh, D, D. I think. Yeah. So you're deselected. Okay. There you go. Aha! You know Photoshop better than me, my friend. I am married to uh, a Photoshop, Photoshop wizard. wizard yes. So I ha I sort of have to know. <laughs> I'm nowhere near what she can do, but. Do you use Photoshop? I do. Yeah, I, I use okay. Photoshop quite a bit. But uh, nice. you're you're rocking it, man. I mean, I'm I'm very impressed. I'm just I'm loving the way this is turning out, and you've kind of inspired me to look back at some old some old landscape work and really take a different approach and just have some fun with it, um, especially around Earth Day. And um, it's just it's again like you mentioned this earlier. It's what I love so much about these streams. I think the format of Adobe Live just continues to get better, and um, having people on here like you, Paco, really uh, inspire not just me, but everyone in the chat and those that are going to be wa watching this video to get out there and shoot and also then get creative with the edit and, and uh, come back to Lightroom and, and Photoshop and make something as cool as this. Yeah. I'm glad I'm giving that inspiration. Okay. So I like how this is looking. Um, I do want to add a little more design elements to it. So I kind of want to space, like, you know, it's two different things, California, and Nevada. So there's like, I don't know what you call it, but, um, there's like a little like just circle that you can use in a keyboard. Like, I don't know, what's that called? Circle dot keyboard. <laughs> I think if you press option eight or something, it'll bring up a like in, it might do it. I'm not totally sure. Option, See, option eight, eight. Give you like. Oh my goodness, James, you are blowing there minds here, my friend. That's I've used there this before and I had to go to Google and like see it, then copy it and paste it. Um, but wow, you taught me something. That's what I love about these live streams. Yeah, it's oh, we, we're man, learning from each so other. So much, here. so much. Okay, that way. So, yeah, that there we go. Cool. Now we're separated. This is California. Now this is Nevada. Uh, I do want to make this sharp. Now I kind of wish I had a different font family. Oh well, well, you know, this is something that I'll do offline. But you know, this is kind of bold, and then you know, I kind of want this to be not so bold. So you know, just kind of adds that design element to it. But maybe that's something I'll do offline, but you see the idea here. You know, we're separating right, these two. Right. Okay. Um, I do want to center this. Okay. Um, and then what else do I want to do here? Let me actually make this a little smaller. Okay. So maybe let's do 40. Yeah, let's meet me in the middle. Let's do 43. And then we will center this once more. Go to California, Nevada. Go boop. Okay. And then let's just add some. Let's add some lines, right? Like some lines that just kind of go out from here to the edge of this. 
Um, mm -hmm. So just like any of the other Photoshop apps when you're designing, you can hit Command R and give yourself some guides, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and take a ruler out and match it up to the lake here, okay? Seems about right, seems to be snapping, okay? Then I'm gonna do another one in the opposite side. So let's go right here, okay? And then I'm just gonna take my line tool. So right here, oh, which one? Oh, there we go, this one. And I'm just gonna draw a line, I'm gonna hold shift, okay? Boom, All right? And then let me give it a fill of the same text as that one, there we go. Okay. The, or is it the stroke? I think I want the stroke actually. Okay, and then let's increase it by five pixels to make sure that we have it. There it is, okay, cool. All right, so I am ADD about this stuff, so I wanna make sure that I have the right spacing between the text and this line so I can match it up on the other side. Okay, so I think it's option or command that shows me the guides. There we go, so we're, there, there let's say go. 49 pixels away from this text. So we'll do this once more. Command Jane, well, let's <laughs> call this left line, All right? Boom, All right? And then we'll say Perfect. right line, okay? And then let's move this right line to the other side. Be cool to round those uh, edges too on that line to sort of match the the weight of the, of the uh, font that you have. That sounds like a great idea, James, could you, let me know how to so, do it because I have no idea how so to round it. Where you have you have the appearance up to the right where your fill and stroke is, uh, uh, okay. and yeah. under that line you'll see that there's different options to like miter it or create little rounded edges. And I think that mm -hmm. one in the middle, if you this click right that appearance, yep. Oh yeah, it's like you a should buck be able cap. to round. Yep, yeah. it's just like a little buck okay. cap. Okay. Yeah, so I know how to do cool that in to... Photo or sorry, After Effects. And it's funny, I used to fight against um, Photoshop for so long that I would actually go into uh, after effects to do this stuff <laughs> just because i oh man app so much better um is it actually doing it though it should be let's see the right line it might be that might be the left side and then the um oh, right, right side of it is the here. other one so to the right of that uh oh right here uh i'm not sure it's one of those oh. that you play well, around with so I do like the idea. I'm going to figure this out offline because yeah, yeah. I know we're yeah, yeah. running out of time here. Oh my goodness, we have five minutes. Okay, let me finish this line real quick. Um, sure. I might not get it as perfect as I was hoping to, but again, the idea still stands. Okay, so 47 pixels. I know it's at 49, so we're going to do one, two. Oh my gosh. Okay, one, two. There we go. Then I'm going to hit A just to expand this. We'll bring it to this line. Aha. Okay. This is looking good, my friends. Looks so good. Okay. So let's get rid of these guides. So I'm going to go to um, view. Let's get over the rulers and then go to view and we will uh, clear our guides. Okay, cool. cool. So this is looking cool. Now I want to add one more thing to really sell that this is a print and that is just giving it a border. So it's pretty easy. We're going to go to image, go to canvas size. Okay, and then we're gonna make sure that relative is checked because I'm gonna do it relative to the current um, photo. And I'll hit the center. And then I like to add one inch borders, okay? So we're gonna hit one and hit one and then hit okay, okay? Ah. Cool, and then we're gonna add a, that's not what I wanted. We're gonna add a, a solid fill color. So we'll go here and then let's, here. Let's drag Dragon. this puppy down. There we go. Cool. White looks good, you know? we. I mean, there's there's things that we can play with. So, you know, again, we can take elements of um, our color palette that we have. And we go go with the blue. We can go with the orange. All right, chat, let me know. What do you think? Do you want the yeah. blue? Do we want the orange? Do we want to go straight white? White doesn't look bad, honestly. Um, I'm digging white. I feel black. like even maybe like just a, a slight off white, like just maybe five, ten percent gray would look okay, kind of cool. What you mean. Yeah, just bring it um, down again, just a little again, bit. Old poster style looks great. Uh, Laura thinks blue. Jan thinks white. We got a, a hot debate happening over here with the last five hot minutes debate. left. Ooh, I, I actually kind of like the yellow, but it may be more of like a maybe like a muted yellow, even something that's a little more. Uh, more along that. I like, like white, so I'm gonna keep it yeah. um, like that just for now. 
Yeah. And yeah. then I want to bring this up just a little bit closer. There you go. And then again, this is, I don't like how uh, this line is a lot longer than the other one. So this is going to play around with, but we're running out of time here. So I do want to do one more thing. So I want to add kind of a linear gradient as a camera raw filter to really um, pop out this text. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these images and I'm going to convert into a smart object. So the way I like to think of it is think of it as After Effects when you're pre-composing, you know, you're putting things inside yep. of other things so that you can put things on that. That's what pre-composing is doing, okay? And we'll say these are our photos, okay? And then I'm gonna add a new filter. So I'm gonna go to Filter, Camera Raw Filter. And then this is gonna be pretty cool because this is gonna look familiar. Check this out. <laughs> this is pretty much the exact interface as Lightroom. And check this out, friends. We already know how to use a linear gradient because it's pretty much the exact same thing in uh, Lightroom. Oh, so we're gonna hit the masking. We'll go to linear gradient. Okay, and then same deal here, folks. Let me go ahead and just extend this out, right? Maybe, you know, I'm, not, I'm gonna get rid of that feathering a little bit just so it doesn't feather too much. And again, where the red is, that is where the, um, the adjustments are gonna take place. So, um, O doesn't work on camera raw filter to get rid of that, but there is a show overlay that I can just do that. And then I'm going to turn that exposure down. Okay. So again, subtly subtleness is the key here. And then Absolutely. I'll hit okay. And then, you know, ch check that out. Okay. Dude. So it's just kind of popping that text out a little more. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Really, really wow. selling that. Okay. So this is looking cool. Let's go ahead and export this very quickly. And again, I'll, I will fine tune this offline, but I think, you know, the idea is definitely here. So we'll go to export, quick export as PNG. Let's just save it to the desktop. We'll do Lake Tahoe Earth Day. So as you, uh, as you export this and wrap up, I just want to kind of uh, let everyone know to get their last, last questions in. We have two minutes left here. I genuinely don't want the stream to end. Paco, I'm having way too fun watching you do this. Um, and I know everyone else has really enjoyed this. Uh, any any final closing remarks you have uh, for those that are on the chat? I know we went over a ton and I, I don't want to uh, have you run out of time before you say what you need to say. Uh, no, not really. Um, I do want to shout out or just let's look at our final part. Look at this, friends. Look at it. Look oh, at my what goodness. We have created today. Let me make sure we're not covering this on the video. It that looks is so cool. Good. Okay, so I'm gonna work on this, and this is what I'm just gonna give away uh, to anybody that donates to again my personal fundraiser, just for for good. This is for the Earth, friends. So just go ahead this and um, yeah, just you know, I honestly don't care what you donate. I don't care if you're doing a follower. I think the minimum is five dollars. So even if you do five dollars, just go ahead and donate. Hit that contact button down here. Uh, let me know that you've donated. And then I have a separate email tied to this where I will give you a print of what we worked on. So it's either this, you know, or this, but I will awesome. work on it. Awesome. Um, oh. But yeah, well, again, this, let's, thank do, let's you. get some good positivity going here for the earth. We all love it. I love it. I want future generations to enjoy it as much as we do. Um, you know, it's, it's, it sounds me the places that I love growing up in California. A lot of them has, you know, the wildfires are, they're, just, they're not going to be the same for generations. So, you know, we Couldn't all, all got to do man. something here. I mean, there's obviously a lot to that. It's not just like climate change. There's other things that play into it. But, you know, Absolutely. I like it. It's, it's good. It's good to get, take some action. So, yeah. Absolutely. Stuff. Well, thank you. Thank you, Paco. Um, again, like I like I mentioned, I had a blast hosting you today um, and really just seeing your process for a change. Um, again, for those that are popping in at the end, uh, right before we wrap up, Paco's links are all over the chat. He's on Instagram. Uh, he is the the king of video production here over at Adobe and an incredible landscape photographer and a lover of the earth, as am I. So Paco, thank you so much. Uh, as we wrap up here again, uh, Earth Day 2020 is all about investing in our planet. We will be back tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time for part two of the Earth Day streams, uh, where the roles might be a little bit reversed and you might see me on the, uh, the end of creating a video edit. Uh, we're going to be diving into Premiere Pro, so very excited about that. And Paco will be will be hosting me. Uh, and we are going to be continuing our Best of Creative Challenges theme. So stick around for a creative encore of the Illustrator Creative Challenges, where you'll learn a new skill in the app every day. Uh, and following the Creative Challenge Encore, join Christina Jackson as she gives you a crash course on packaging design. Man, there's a lot going on at Adobe this week. There's a lot. I am really excited. There's a lot. Um, and 
everyone that's watching, uh, when you're not on Adobe Live, get outside, enjoy the beautiful planet that is our home, and uh, you know, don't take it for granted. Really, uh, you know, care for it the way the way we should. So, with that being said, Paco, mm -hmm. thanks again. Thank you to those on the stream, and we will see you tomorrow. Yep. See you all tomorrow. Bye bye.